tonight I want to just dive in and I want to talk to you about strategies, strategies for winning over fear and depression. Strategies for winning over fear and depression. Uh, I, I want to say this, you know, I, one thing I found out in, in my years of ministry, I didn't used to preach as much as I do now. I used to do lots of music and you know, I play a lot of concerts, do some sermonizing but now, because I have the privilege of being the lead pastor of this great church, Exalt Church, I get to preach pretty regularly. And Pastor Sean, of course, comes alongside and helps me out at times, does a great job. And we're just going to turn him loose and let him do some stuff coming up here. It's going to be good. But, but what I've learned about being a preacher is interesting. The Bible says this, there is no temptation that has taken you or has come upon you or has attacked you that's not common to mankind. So anything that you've gone through, what you have to remind yourself is you're not the only one. There's many other people who've been touched by all these different kinds of temptations. These things are extant in the earth. And I've found as a preacher, that's really, really a little bit of a challenge because often I have to declare and I have to preach what I preach, even though I may be in the middle of a battle myself in that very area. And so whenever I preach stuff, it could be something about finances. It could be something about relationships and families. It could be something about getting along with your beautiful wife. Whatever it may be. Come on, are you here? Right? I, I, I've got to get up and I've got to declare it even though sometimes... I don't have it totally figured out. How many know when the prophets prophesied, often they prophesied stuff that they hadn't totally understood. But God's spirit was bringing something up for the benefit of history, the benefit of, of people, the benefit of nations. And sometimes when you're behind a pulpit or you're preaching or teaching, you have to just preach by faith. Yes. And so I, 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 you know, in this case, I, I've been touched by this in my own life. I've had a couple of episodes where I've had to battle fear and depression. And you know what? I'm going to say this. I'm one of the, I've been historically through my life one of the happiest people you ever know. Even when I wasn't a Christian, I was the happy-go-lucky, as they used to say, right guy, right? I just kind of got along with people, and I liked my music, and I would play stuff. And, you know, that's the way I function. That's the way I rolled. You know what I'm saying? But, but, but even that person who has that natural disposition may have the most pleasant personality, which, of course, I wouldn't have ascribed to myself because I had my moments, right? But I'm just saying they may be a very positive person, but the reality is we've all been touched in various ways by this very thing. Fear, depression, anxiety, it comes against the human race. Back a few weeks ago I talked about Satan's number one weapon. I don't know if you remember when I talked about that, but I preached about Satan's number one weapon. And what was it? It was temptation. When Satan came to Jesus to try to trip him up in the wilderness, you know what I'm saying, right? He brought temptations. He tempted Christ. But I would say one of the main weapons that Satan will use, maybe even second in line to temptation. Maybe number two would be fear, anxiety, depression. And it can attack your life because it's extant in the world. There's no temptations taken me or attacked me or attacked you that's not common to man. So if you're in the middle of going through a rough season, you're in the middle of going through something tough and you're really, really battling, listen, we're right there with you. I can empathize and I can tell you there's light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not an un oncoming train. How many understand the light is the light and the glory of God at the end of the tunnel, right? Hang with it. Stay with it. Understand that God can bring you through. I can show you examples of people in the Bible who were in deep depression. I can show you prophets who complained and moaned to God and were literally clinically depressed because there's no temptation that has taken any of us that's not common to man. And, and, it, and it was so important for us to understand that, that God put it in his word. I think there's something about understanding that you're not alone, that is part of God's plan when you're in the middle of a deep valley. And I understand what that feels like. I understand having a fear come against you. And it's not just a blue Monday. It's not just I feel a little out of sorts. 
It's not some kind of a just a, uh, you know, a, a little hitch in my get along. That's, no, I'm talking about something that is immobilizing. I'm talking about something where hopelessness fills your soul. I'm talking about something you can't explain. Now, I don't know if everybody's experienced that level of depression or anxiety, but I'm telling you that those kind of things do hit some of us some of the time. And certainly on some level, all of us have been touched by that emotion. And it, and it can attack in various ways. Now, I'm going to give you a verse in just a minute. I'm going to unpack that verse to try to give you some strategies for winning over fear and depression. So it's not the victor because you're not designed to be the loser. You're not the tail. You're the head. You're not uh, down below. You're above only. Come on. Above only, the Bible says. You know, you're blessed in the city, blessed in the country. How many consider yourselves country dwellers? Wave your hand at me. Okay, there's some country. Is there anybody besides... Yeah, okay, I'm pretty much country. We're kind of sort of countryish. Uh, how many are city dwellers? Come on, wave your hand. Okay, you're blessed in the city. You're blessed in the country. This is what the Bible says. I've come to tell you that God gives us strategies for winning, winning victory over fear, depression, anxiety. And so I deal with the same kind of stuff. I've dealt with it in my life. And so this is one topic where I can get up and I can preach about it. And I can say to you, God's got answers. God's got help. And he's got it ready and waiting for you. So this is, this is my encouragement to you. Look for victory and do not be denied. I want you to turn with me or flip on your device to Ezra, the third chapter. It was just like the Holy Spirit one day. I wasn't thinking about this. I had no idea where I was headed with it, but God took me directly to this verse. Ezra, the third chapter and the third verse. And we're going to read this together, and then I want to try to talk about it a little bit. We're going to try to delve into it. Ezra 3, verse 3. And this is in the NIV in this particular case. I don't use that very often, but I felt like it was a very good way to express it. So here it is. Despite their fear. Let me read those three words again. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening sacrifices. Now, we're talking about Ezra, who was a scribe and a theologian among the Jewish people. We're talking about his compatriot, Nehemiah, Ezra, and Nehemiah in the Bible go together. And they had been carried off to Babylon. The people had been taken to Babylon. And for a long time, everything was busted down in their hometown back in Jerusalem. Everything was burnt. Everything was destroyed. The wall was knocked over. Things were out of sorts. There was no place of worship. They had had that place previously. They had had that experience previously. But something had come along and messed it up. And so Ezra and Nehemiah, they get this opportunity to go back and build the city and build the temple of praise and build their homeland again. This is so important. And so when they're coming back into this arena, back into this area, that's where this verse kicks in. They get back into their old previous hometown because they were in Babylon for 70 years. 70 years. But they come back to where their, their, their ancestors had, had worshipped God. They come back to where they had lived. They come back and they find everything busted down, rubble all around. How many know there's sometimes busted down lives? How many know there's sometimes rubble in our lives? Sometimes things aren't the way they used to be. Sometimes something's come along and done a number on you or a number on your marriage or a number on your family or a number in your uh, purview, your job, whatever it may be. Sometimes in this world, there's these attacks and these things burst through and they break down what we used to know. But that doesn't mean it can't be restored. They had a vision to come back and restore what the enemy had destroyed. God is always a restorer. God is a restorer of the breach. God is a restorer of the broken. God is a restorer of those that are lost. We've been talking and singing about that very thing tonight. So despite their fear of the peoples around them, when they got back in, they saw a lot of nasty people, scary people, big people. They saw a bunch of people who looked like they might be in some kind of Hell's Angel motorcycle gang. They saw some people who didn't look like they were right there to play, have a Tupperware party. How many understand that? 
They, they, they had fear rise up. See, it's not unusual to feel fear. It's normal. And sometimes fear can be healthy. How many think if you're crossing Cortez Road walking along, you ought to have a very healthy fear of a bus coming along and hitting you? How many think that kind of fear is a good kind of fear? So fear can be a very positive, legitimate thing, but it's when it gets grotesque and contorted and it starts dominating your spirit, dominating your mind, and it gets out of hand, and it starts destroying, and it starts tearing down, and it starts debilitating you, so you can't be the way you used to be. And so here they have this fear of the people around them. But despite that, and this is what I want you to see, there was something inside of them that rose up despite their fear, despite their anxieties, despite the depression that they probably felt when they looked at this busted down situation. It's almost like having a hole in your spirit or your soul. And you wonder, can we ever get this fixed? Can I ever feel normal again? Can I ever get my feet underneath me? Can I be there for my kids and my grandkids? Can I be there for my family? But in spite of their fear, they build an altar on its foundation and sacrifice burnt offerings to the Lord, both morning and evening. They come back into a mess. I don't know if you might be in a mess tonight. In your soul, your spirit, you may, you may, feel, you may feel like you're in the middle of a real mess. I've been there. I was happy, 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 happy in my life for 25 years. I mean, happy. When I got saved, I went to exponential happy. I mean, I was happy like with a, to the 10th power. Come on, somebody. I just was. I mean, I had a beautiful wife. I got a couple of kids, great kids. God was blessing, guiding us. I had opportunity to minister. I loved the music I was doing, and I got up one night in the middle of the night, and this fear attacked me. I mean, it was like a vicious dog grabbing a hold of me, pulling me down. Out of nowhere, I was totally unprepared. And I'm trying to tell you, we don't need to be unprepared, but I was. And, and, and all of a sudden, I, I have this thing get a hold of me, and I mean, I mean, it grabbed a hold and wouldn't let go. And I sang songs, and I prayed in tongues, and I rebuked the devil. I rebuked the demons. I did everything I could do. I'm not saying it didn't have impact. I think it did have impact. What I'm telling you is I was in for a battle. I was in for building something over time. And some of us get in those circumstances. Sometimes it's reversals in life that bring us into that place. Sometimes it's just an absolute demonic attack. And believe you me, the devil will attack you, and often he will use anxiety, depression, worry, and fear. So what did they do? Here's what I want you to notice, and this is the lesson we can learn. I want to give you a few points out of this verse, and then I'm going to share another verse with you, give you a few final points. Watch this. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built. You were created by God. You were created in the image of God to be a builder. You, you were created. Your instinct is going to be to get to work. When faced with fear, these people went to work. You're designed after your creator. Imago Deo. Is the Latin. It means in the image of God. You bear the image. You're an image bearer. Don't ever let the devil diminish that. You're bearing the image of God. And what does that mean? That means you're creative. That means you're a builder. God built the worlds. God built the planets. God spoke and all these things came together. God is a builder. We are builders as well. And what I like about this is they could have been petrified by the fear. They could have said, I feel horrendous. I'm pulling this thing into neutral. As a matter of fact, I'm not even putting it in neutral. I'm going to put it in park. And there's a lot of people, when that fear comes, and I'm talking about a clinical, I'm talking about a severe fear. What happens is they go to neutral, and then they put it in park, and pretty soon you can't even get them out of their house. You ever hear of agoraphobia? And sometimes it is a physical issue. Some people don't get enough vitamin D. Come on, somebody. I'm just going to go nutritionist on you right now. Is that all right, Melanie? 
Vitamin D. You got to have your vitamin D. You got to make sure you got your diet decent. You got to get yourself pulled together, get enough sleep. All those things impact your physical body. But how many understand some of these things go a lot deeper than that? They're spiritual. They're soulish. They get down inside of you. And so what I'm telling you is I love and admire these people. They would not allow the fear to paralyze them. They simply would not do it. There's something about that that honors God. There's something about wild abandon in faith that makes a difference in our lives. I'm not going to let the devil dictate to me. I'm not going to let my fear dictate to me. I'm not going to let my worry scare me. I'm not going to get to a place where I'm immobilized, I'm paralyzed, I'm petrified by any of those things because I'm a child of the Lord. I'm blessed of the Father. I am the one who God has chosen to go out and spread the good news. How am I going to go out and spread the good news if I can't even go out my front door? We've got to come against fear with spiritual weapons. we got to come against anxiety with worship and praise. But you know what I noticed? They built. They said, I'm going to build something. you got to get to work. Look at Genesis 2.15. Come on, watch this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. What? To work it and take care of it. That's the way we were designed to do that. That was before the fall. Somebody said, well, that was the fall. That was part of the, no, that was, work's not a curse. Work's a blessing. Work's beautiful. You can do something with your life. You can build something wonderful. You can build a business, build a ministry, build a family, build a marriage. Don't let fear stop you from doing that very thing that we see God created them to do. Be productive, be fruitful. And God will honor that. So when you have fear come against you, anxiety, can I suggest you just plug right into something and build something? You say, devil, take that. We've been working around here getting things ready for the circle school year. All these over 100 students coming in to be trained and inspired in the Lord and recognize their talents flourishing. We've been in here and we've been working. People have been in here helping. What a great team of people. And by the way, thank you guys. All of you who have been here on these work days. We've had a bunch of people show up. I know some of you are working all the time out in the work-a-day world, you know, but you can't be here. But many people have come and helped us. And you know what? We're building something important, something great. We're in a messed up world with messed up ideas. We better have a place where our children can develop their talents, engage the culture, recognizing that God is God, and we serve that great and mighty creator. I'm going to hear what I'm saying. So we're building something. We're not schlepping. We're building something. Satan wants you to drift to a stop. If he can get that, if he can stop you from building, that's it. No, no. You're here to build great children. Has anybody got any kids out here tonight listening to me? You're here to build great kids than how to go out there and take on the devil and stand up for Jesus and be dignified, honest, ethical, filled with the glory of God. That's what we're here to do. You parents, listen to me. This is building time. This isn't stop time. The devil will try to bring fear up. He'll bring anxiety. You feel immobilized. Just shake it off in the name of Jesus, whatever you do. If you can only put one brick in place, get that one brick, pray over it, and set it in place in the name of Jesus. You might be surprised what you end up building if you just do that very thing. I could talk about career. I could talk about education. I could talk about a lot of things. You're building. Don't let that thing stop. Look what it says. They built the altar. I love that. They built the altar. They could have built a lot of things. But what does it say? They built the altar. When faced with fear, they made a commitment to worship. They said, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm scared right now. These guys look nasty. I think they've got some guns. they got some knives. I don't know what's going on. But you know what? I'm not going to let my fear paralyze me. I'm going to build something, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to build something that I can use to worship God. I'm going to put a commitment on worship 
in the face of fear. When you're faced with fear, can I suggest to you that you find a place to worship, that you build into your life a schedule that allows you to worship, that you come to God in the times the church gathers and you say, this is my opportunity to worship and honor God. I'm going to wave my hands. I'm going to bounce. I'm going to sing out a tune. It doesn't matter. Rock your house. Rock your world. Rock the church. Get your praises on. Come on, somebody. How many believe we ought to rock the praise? Come on, say it with me. I'm going to rock the praise. Say it again. I'm going to I'm going to do it. Because when I'm faced with fear, I know that's one of the strategies for bringing that down. I'm going to stay in worship. I don't feel like it. When I had that depression hit me, Lisa can test to it. I'm not going to tell you all the details. I was a mess. I don't even like to talk about it too much because I don't want to. I don't want to make make too much of a negative statement about it. But but what, what but what I found out is that that um, excuse me, what I found out is that that the devil wanted to immobilize me. He wanted to be bring bring me down to where I couldn't move left or right, forward or backward. I would go to work in the morning after that thing hit me. I'd battle. I'd speak in tongue. I'd be singing. I'd be in that that thing, and I'd be sitting at my desk. I sold pianos and organs for a living. And I'd be sitting at my desk, and that thing would rise up, and it would come against me, and I'd have to get up with tears in my eyes. Now listen to me. How many know I'm a happy preacher? How many know that? I shout and spit a lot, but I'm basically happy. How many know that? Right? And I'd have to get up, and I'd have to go back in the back because I was embarrassed. This thing was overcoming and coming against me, and I had to go in the back in the bathroom, get a drink of water, and stand back in there and try to compose myself. There were a few times where I would get in my car and excuse myself, tell the boss, I'm, I can't do it, and I'd have to leave and go home. A bunch of times I sat on the edge of the bed and rebuked the devil and sang and spoke. And I just sat in the edge of the bed, tried to get through the next few hours. You say, Randy, why didn't you just get over it? Can I give you some advice? Don't just say that to somebody who's going through real serious anxiety. Because it's not explainable. It's on some fundamental level, spiritual, soulish, in various ways it manifests. And I'm not telling you not to encourage people. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is the primary battle... The primary way to victory is spiritual in nature. Take care of business. Take your vitamin D. Come on, somebody. Eat some veggies. Do what you can for yourself, for your physical body. But what I'm telling you is we need biblical strategies. And so I'm not going to drift to a stop. I'm not going to be paralyzed. I'm not going to be petrified. I'm going to build something. And when I do, the first thing I'm going to do is build a place of worship. My home is a place of worship. My car is a place of worship. My life is a place of worship. I'm going to build that because I'm not going to give in to fear. And defeating fear starts with building a commitment to worshiping God no matter what. I'm trying to see if you guys are agreeing with me. I think you are. Are, are, are you with me on this? Do, do, you, do, you think that that, do you think that this is this is some truth from the Bible? They saw the men and the women. They saw and with fear they, they walked into that arena. But they built an altar. Building an altar shows that they intended to honor God for everybody to see. Commit. I'm in this with the Lord. I don't care what happens. I'm in this. Luke, in his gospel, talks about Jesus praying in a certain place. Jesus went into a certain place to pray. Many commentators and theologians believe that that was a regular occurrence. He had a place where he went to pray. All of us ought to prepare a place to worship, a place to pray. Maybe it's in your bedroom. Maybe it's in your easy chair. Maybe it's someplace else on your ground. Maybe it's out in the woods. Maybe it's going for a walk. When I go for a walk, whenever I can go out, when it's not this hot and it's not raining, I go out and I speak in tongues and I dodge mailboxes and garbage trucks. Come on, somebody. Are you here? And I just, because I want to be in that place of worship. You want to do that. I remember John 18, 1 and 2. Look at these verses. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out from his disciples over the book Brook Kidron, where there was a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. Why? For Jesus often met there with his disciples. He had a place of worship. He had a place of prayer. He had a place where he communed and taught, and he, and he, and he, and he connected can we all agree that we need the same thing? Can we, can we, can we just say that? 
We need a place of worship. They committed to a place of worship. Okay, so what does it say? Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation. When faced with fear, they returned to their foundation. Revelation says it this way, return to your first love. Whatever's been foundational in your life, and I'm going to name a couple quickly and then move on. Get it back where it needs to be. Often the stuff has been broken down in our lives because we've been through some tough things. We've been through some difficulties. We've waded through some stuff. And by the time we got through the swamp, got to the other side, we've lost some of our joy. We lost some of our compulsion to pray. Find out what's foundational to you. It's been a while, Randy. It's been a while since I really, really fervently prayed. Get back to your foundation. Prayer is foundational. Randy, it's been a while since I really read the Bible carefully and did it consistently. Can I just encourage you, when faced with fear, get back to your foundation. Get the word out. Read the Bible. Those scriptures can bring joy in your heart, even at the darkest of times. It can give you something to hang on to as you're battling against the winds, the contrary winds of this life, and against the demons of hell. It can give you something. as a, The Bible says that it's a sword of the Spirit. Wield the scriptures. Have a warrior spirit. You'll be amazed what God can do. It's been a long time, Randy, since I made praise a part of my daily routine. Well, why haven't you been praising the Lord? The Bible says, let everyone that has breath praise the Lord. Does it say that? What does the Bible say? His praise, David said it, will continually be in my mouth. Implement that worship. Implement those foundational principles. Implement those things, and I believe you'll see breakthrough. The next thing that I notice in this scripture is, when faced with fear, they offered sacrifices in the morning and in the evening. They went back to sacrificing to God. See, a lot of times, we don't want to sacrifice our time. We don't want to sacrifice our funds. We don't want to sacrifice... The, the, the interests we have and the things that we love to do, we never want to displace those things from our lives because we want to pursue what we want. And we want to fill our lives with those things that titillate us and those things that kind of give us a little buzz. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes those things have to be set aside. Sometimes those things need to be attenuated so that God can rise up within us and his sacrifice can be honored. And what does the Bible say? It says the sacrifice includes prayer. It includes praise, the things I've just mentioned, but it goes beyond that. <clears throat> Most of the time, it's about other people sacrificing. I find when you're based, faced with fear, or you're faced with anxiety, you got to get real interested in being otherly, right? Uh, the other person. I was thinking about Jesus hanging on the cross. How many believe the Son of Man and his humanity probably was a little depressed hanging up on that cross? I have a feeling in his humanity, he was, he was seeing some fear. You say, Randy, that doesn't sound like Jesus. Well, what did he say in the Garden of Gethsemane? If it's possible, God, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. How many believe that that road rose from a place of fear? He saw what was coming. He saw the whipping and the scourging and the crown of thorns and the piercing and the spitting and the mocking. And in his humanity, he had to deal with that. And here he is hanging on the cross for everybody to see naked before the world. The creator of God, the creator of all things, hanging on a cross, crucified by unrighteous men, of which I am one. But what did Jesus do? He was all about others. He was in the deepest, darkest possible kind of thing I can imagine about to die, carrying the sins of the human race upon him. Whew. And what did he say? Father, forgive them. Do you see the otherliness? Do you see it? For God, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When he was faced with fear and terror, what did he say? John, behold your mother. He pointed to his mother, Mary. How many understand he was all about others? 
Then he's got this wretched thief on one side, another thief on the other side. One of them breaks down and recognizes who he's talking to. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What did Jesus say? This day you shall be with me in paradise. He was ministering from the cross, from a deep, dark place to everybody around him. Is that what you're doing? You want to defeat fear? You just, the devil will give up on you. The de- you do that, the devil will start to give up on you. He'll just say, you know what? I can't win with this one. And how many know, hallelujah, that's the way it ought to be. The devil cannot defeat you. Love, reach out, concern yourself with your family. Do everything you can. I don't care how lousy you feel. Focus on Jesus. Fear will bring you down. Fear is a weapon of the enemy. Listen to Peter. Peter says, Lord, I'm going to walk on the water to you. What did the Bible say? He walked on the water, but when he saw the wind and the waves, he began to fear. And it began to sink. There's many other examples I could give you. I won't take the time. We got to keep moving. I want to read a couple of scriptures to show you how sacrifices make all the difference. This is a, several verses in Jeremiah 33. Two verses. Two verses in Jeremiah 33. Are you ready? Thus says the Lord. Listen to this very carefully. I hope you guys will listen. Please listen to me. Here's what God said to them. Again, there shall be heard in this place of which you say it is desolate, empty, devoid of life. I feel empty inside. I feel dry inside. I feel intimidated. Thus says the Lord again, there shall be heard in this place of which I say it is desolate. You say it is desolate without man or without beast in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without man and without inhabitant and without beast. There shall be heard the voice of joy and the voice of Gladness, you ought to be saying amen right now. And the voice of the bridegroom, that's me, 47 years. And the voice of the where the, the bride, that's her, 47 years. Come on, somebody. Come on. The voice of those who say, praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever. And of those who, he w- who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Notice that the praises are partly what we're talking about here. That's what sets you free. And those things that feel desolate. There's hopelessness inside, darkness inside. I don't even know what to do. I get up in the morning and I'm crying, sitting around, trying to figure out what in the world's going on. Might not ever happen to you, but it's happened to a lot of people. Don't drift to a stop. Build. Build an altar, a place, commit to worship. Build it on a foundation. You know that foundation has worked for you in your life. And if you haven't made Jesus the foundation, you better. Storms may be coming. I understand that. You better have a foundation. You better be standing on a rock. You better get Jesus in your life. And not only should you do that, but you should also have a heart where you bring a sacrifice of praise. Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him, Jesus, let us continually, please say continually, Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us. Do you understand what you're doing? You're praying and you're worshiping and you're defeating the devil. See, Randy, I don't feel victorious. You know what? Give it a little time. Don't give up on God. How many know faith is a matter of time often? I have to have faith because faith is the evidence of things I haven't quite yet seen. I haven't quite yet seen it, but I got faith. I'm going to keep building. I'm going to make a place of worship. I'm committing to worship. I'm going to get into a place where I can lift up the sacrifices of praise before God. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to finish with a very quick, rapid-fire word study. Very, I'm going to go one other scripture. I'm going to break it down very quickly. Please, you're going to need to listen fast because I'm going to preach at the speed of light. Get ready. All of this that I've been talking about and those things that attack you and the things that come into your life and the people around you, if you've got somebody in your purview, pray for them that's having trouble with this thing. 
Suicide's at an all-time high among certain aspects of our generation these days. People are giving up hope. The church is all about hope. The church is all about taking authority over darkness, over depression, taking authority over fear. <clears throat> That's what we're called to be. You need to be a warrior of the joy of the Lord. Come on, somebody. Is anybody here tonight? A warrior of the joy of the Lord. And if it's not for you, it's for somebody else. Rapid fire, though. I want to go to a verse. I want to break it down. Because ultimately, all of this is relational. It's about our Father in heaven. It's about our elder brother. It's about the Holy Spirit that comforts us. you got to have that relationship with God. you got to have it. Let's read Psalm 94. Three verses, 17 through 19. Please carefully listen, because I'm going to move very quickly now. I need to finish. Psalm 94, verse 17 through 19. Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would soon have settled in silence. If I say, my foot slips... Your mercy, O oh Lord, will hold me up. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. In the midst of the anxiety. In the midst of the anxiety. Right in the middle of it. And you'll notice he said, in the multitude. How many know sometimes these kind of things can multiply? How many understand when you get something like that attacking you, it almost seems like it breaks out in other ways, and sometimes you feel like you're surrounded this can be applied to a lot of areas of life, but I'm talking to you right now about overcoming fear and winning over depression, beating down anxiety and getting yourself in a place where there's so much joy bursting out of you that you finally see the light break through the clouds. And that's what we're looking for. That's what we're believing for. Now look at this. I want you to look at, at four words. Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would have soon have settled in silence. Please say silence. The Hebrew word there is duma, duma. And like I said, the number one weapon that the devil uses is temptation. But I think very close behind it, perhaps second, is depression, fear, and anxiety. I've already made that point, but listen to me. One of the aims of the enemy is to silence you. He just wants you to shut up and go sit in a fetal position in the corner well, I will not shut up. How many know that I have no problem with that? I talk all the time. And I will not sit in a fetal position in the corner. Sometimes you've got to have a little warrior in you. Sometimes you've got to find some help from somebody. And you've got to tie in with them. And you've got to work through it. You've got to push hard. Listen, silence, silence, silence. Do ma. It means he's trying to silence your praise. How many understand that your words are powerful? How many get that, that your words are powerful? This is one of the biggest areas that I have to have help. Thank God my wife's very willing to tell me what I need to hear. Sometimes over and over and over again. Thank you, Lisa, for doing that. Because whatever comes in my mind, I have a tendency to just say it. I'm verbal. Did anybody notice that? I will talk to you about how to look up a number on the internet. I will tell you all kind of ways how to do it. I'm just verbal, that's all. What I'm saying to you is that the devil is working to try to silence your words of declaration. He doesn't want you to say, I'm the blessed of the Father. He doesn't want you to say, I have the Holy Ghost who gives me liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. He doesn't want you to declare those things over your life. He's trying to take you into silence, Duma. Proverbs 18.21 says this, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk, how many are guilty? Come on, I'm one of them. Will reap the consequences. Whether good or bad, you're going to get a harvest. Whether good or bad, you're going to get the fruit. And so the thing to do is declare the words of God. Declare the goodness of God. That doesn't mean you can't talk about a problem. It doesn't mean you can't be honest. I get tired of people who build a false construct about faith where you can't say anything or tell the truth about a circumstance because you're operating in unbelief. Oh, pooey, that's crazy. That's crazy. Paul said, Trophimus, have I left sick in Ephesus. 
If Paul could tell the truth, how many know we can tell the truth? You know, don't tell me your arm's not broken. I don't even want to hear that. How many know you can get excessive and extreme on some of these things? But there is a place where worship and praise come together and you declare the word and the word rises up over your enemies and pretty soon you see breakthroughs and pretty soon you get your faith built up. Pretty soon you get your back up and pretty soon you see God break through in your circumstance. See, do you understand what I'm saying? Don't let the devil stop you from declaring the word of the Lord because there's power in your tongue. Literally, the power of death and life is in your tongue. So let's celebrate the goodness of God. How many believe God is able to do anything? How many believe God can move a mountain? How many believe God can ford the river? How many believe that? How many believe God can heal a body? It happened to me. Anybody here understand that you can be lifted out of depression? How many know God can do it? Let's confess the goodness of God. Let's stand in our, in our faith and not be silenced. Isn't that what the scripture says? Lest the Lord had helped me. See, it's relational. My soul would have been Settled in silence. But what does it say on from there? In my, if I say my foot slips, everybody say slips. Now that's an interesting word. It's moat in the Hebrew. It means to totter or to shake or to slip, like tripping over something. He said, if my foot, if I say it, if I say it, your mercy, Lord, will literally hold me up. God's there for you. May I assure you, have faith in God. The next word I want you to notice is anxieties. He says in verse 19, in the multitude of my anxieties, seraph is the Hebrew word. You know what it means? To be divided. It's the opposite of peace. How many know what peace, uh, Hebrew is shalom? Did you know that? Shalom. And it means not just peace, it means wholeness, oneness. Jesus said, if your eye be filled with light, your body will be, if your eye be single, your whole body will be filled with light, Jesus said. You're not divided. You're not torn between in this and that. Satan's not pulling one way, God pulling the other. That's not happening. See, when we get in that kind of situation, that creates anxiety. Having a divided affection, having a divided focus, having a divided heart, a divided mind. Come on, I'm almost done. Stay with me. Listen. Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. Watch this. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Recognize that God's watching over you. Recognize that even if you've got some battles, maybe you've even tripped over some things, maybe you've failed on certain levels, God's got your back. His mercies are always new every day. Please hear what I'm saying. I'm probably talking to a person or two or three or four that's in the middle of a very dark, dark place right now. I come against that in the name of Jesus Christ. I call you forth into the light of Jesus Christ. I come against every work of the enemy. I declare over you that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I declare it in the name of Jesus. Can I get an amen from somebody on that one? Yes, absolutely. We agree together. and we're, we're Now, I love this one, the final word. This is my final thought that I'm going to be done. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comfort. See, it's always God. Everything emanates from God. Go to God. Cry out to God. Your comforts delight my soul. <sighs> I love that word, delights. In the Hebrew, you know what it is? It's sha'ah. And I, I, it, it paints such a cool picture. It paints this incredible, cool picture. Sha'a. Randy, what does that mean? It's so important. Listen to me. This is for every person within the sound of my voice. Even on the internet, please listen to what I'm saying. Isaiah 66, 12 has the same word, sha'a, in it. Can I read it to you before we finish? Are you guys ready to listen? For thus says the Lord... Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles show like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed, watch this, on her sides you will be carried and be dandled on her knees. Dandled is sha'a, and be dandled on her, I, never, I didn't even know what that was. I said, man, this is key because it's in the scripture. It says that whenever I've got anxieties all around me, when I've got anxieties dominating my heart, when I feel fearful and scared and empty and hopeless and I don't know what to do, it says here that God's comforts will dandle my soul. 
So I started looking at what is dandling. I never heard of that. Come on, be honest. Did anybody ever hear the word dandle? I never heard that word. And I like words. Chris, do we have a chair? Give me a chair, buddy. Set it right, set it right over here. Set, set it right here. Okay, so now I want to call up the cutest little guy you'll ever see and his mom to show you what dandel means, okay? So, Julie, would you please come up with Dr. Sampson? And would you stand right here beside me, please, for a moment? Come on, Sampson, you're so cool, man. He's working that thing, whatever it is. He's working it. Is it a pen? Is that what it is? Okay. Oh, this, I'm gonna like, I like this. Because I figured out a new word, man. How many know I love new words? Okay, stand right here for a second. Okay, how many know mom feeds the little baby? Right? And that's what the scripture says. When anxieties are everywhere, when anxieties are all around you, they've multiplied, then you shall feed like a child. Then it says this, on her sides shall you be carried. So, See what, he, see what she's doing? Oh, right there on her hip. Can everybody see that? God's saying he's going to take you like a little child. He's going to wrap his arm around you. I'm about to get emotional. Because every human being needs this. Like a mom feeds, holds that child on her side. And then dandle. He said, God is going to dandle you. He's going to dandle your soul. And this scripture says, and be dandled on the knees. So she's going to sit down. And let's say Samson's really upset. Let's say Samson's hurt. Let's say Samson's scared. Let's say Samson, say maybe he's just really ticked off. Come on, how many know we all have that tendency, right? So what does mom do? Mom puts the child in dandles. Can you do it? That's dandling. Keep it going for a minute. Are you tired? Now, now if he was upset, how many ever took your kid and bounced your child? No, did anybody ever do that? And put him on your knee, bounce him? That's dandling. The Bible says when you have anxiety, God's literally going to take you. He's going to make sure you get fed. He's going to put you on his side. And he's going to put you on his knees. And he's going to dandle you to the point where you're so ecstatic, you scream and yell, just like Samson's doing right now. Come on, is anybody here tonight? When we praise, it's dandling. When we worship, he doesn't want dandled anymore. Okay, stop the dandling. Is Samson amazing? No, come on, somebody. Come on. Is he amazing? Samson and his mom, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Come on, take, be careful coming down these steps here. There you go. Do you, do you, do you, see, do you see the picture at all? Does anybody see the picture? It, it, literally, this is what God does. He, he'll get you bouncing. Because he's trying to bring your spirit into a place of calmness and peace. He'll, he'll, he'll jostle you just a little bit. I've had God do that to me. Now that I thought about it, I found out what dandling is. I'm saying, thank God for dandling. Because God cares about you just that way. Are you hearing me? He's not indifferent to your problem. The Bible says, though he suffer long, he'll come through. Job was perfected through Hanging with it, hanging with it. And he came forth like pure gold. If you're in the middle of a really, really dark place and my words are not even very much reaching you, listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. God cares about you. It may not feel like it. It may not seem obvious. But take it from somebody who's been dandled. God cares about you. He really does.